but I might just get started now and let um, everybody trickle in as I give my introduction. As we come together today, I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land I speak from, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. This is our last history sessions, um, the history book session of the year. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be ending the year with a discussion of Ruth Valen's recently released work, Destination Elsewhere, Displaced Persons in Their Quest to Leave Post-War Europe, which is just out with Cornell University Press this month. Mm. Ruth is an associate professor at UNSW, where she researches and teaches transnational histories of migration, displacement, refugees, and family. Destination is a second book for Destination Elsewhere is her second book for 2021 and follows on from her co-authored book, Smuggled and Illegal History of Journeys to Australia, written with Julie Coleman. Destination Elsewhere offers a masterful close examination of the personal narratives communicated by displaced persons to agencies and agents tasked with their resettlement and protection in the aftermath of the Second World War. In addition to, the, to its contributions to refugee history, political history and histories of the long aftermath of the Holocaust and World War II, which I'm sure we'll hear much more about. In reading it, I also just found myself uh, transfixed by the individual testimonies that populate the book, which make the work really compelling and a joy to read. Today, Ruth is joined by two experts in 20th century migration and refugee history, likely very familiar to everybody here. Sheila Fitzpatrick is a professor of history at the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences at ACU, and also most recently of White Russians Red Peril, a Cold War history of migration to Australia. Peter Gattrell is an emeritus professor at the University of Manchester and author of The Unsettling of Europe, The Great Migration, 1945 to the Present. All of our speakers have written extensively on population displacement and refugee history, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion as it unfolds. Today, we'll have a round table format. We'll begin with a short introduction from Ruth, who will talk a little bit about her book. Then we'll have a commentary from Peter and then Sheila, who will each speak for around 15 minutes. With Ruth will respond and then we'll open up for questions from the audience. Uh, and when it comes to the question time, feel free to uh, either indicate that you have a question in the question box or the easiest thing to do is to use the raise hand button here um, in the bottom right of your screen. And that'll let me know that you have a question. So without anything further from me, I'm going to hand over to Ruth, who's gonna talk a little bit about her book. Thank you, Naomi, for that generous introduction. And I'm really thrilled, um, first of all, that Sheila and Peter agreed to talk about my book. Both of them have been huge inspirations on my work. Um, and some of the people here from far away too, just thank you for making that effort to, to be here today. Um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what started me on this project and a bit about the themes of the book. Uh, over 10 years ago, I traveled to the German spa town of Bad Arlsen which is the site of the International Tracing Service, now renamed the Arlesen Archives. After World War II, the ITS, International Tracing Service, became the storehouse of almost 50 million records linked to 17.5 million people detained, deported, interned and murdered by the Nazi regime. For over 60 years, it was closed to the public, but in late 2007, under international pressure, the archive uh, was finally open to the public. I wasn't there to conduct research. I was there to find out what had happened to my grandmother's family during the Holocaust at her request. But as sometimes happens in the life of a historian, that visit was transformative, leading me on a new journey of discovery that has lasted a decade in study and writing. I was one of the first historians to visit the archive and I share that distinct, distinction with Professor Conrad Queet, who's here with us today. This was long before the files were digitized. I shared a cramped airless room with six of the tracing staff, working alongside one of them and learning the complicated database of names and numbers that allowed tracers to identify the fate of those lost during the war. A room off to the side, happened to house displaced persons' de departure records, lined with folders containing the nominal rolls for ships carrying hundreds of thousands of DPs around the world after World War II, 
departing from Naples, Bremerhaven, Bremen, Marseille, Genoa and Trieste. Across the hall were other rooms containing DP registration cards created when individuals registered for assistance with the Allies after the war. I picked some out at random. Most had very little information and simply recorded the person's date and place of birth, last known address, their physical particulars, and importantly, their desired destination. Occasionally, there were glimpses of a story. I even found my great aunt's card, which recorded that she'd been born in Maitelec, a tiny village on the Hungarian border to Romania. At the bottom was listed the names of her close relatives, next to her mother's name and the names of her two sisters, Auschwitz. While the ITS has become famous for the information it contains about the fate of those who perished under the Nazis and the ways in which the Nazi regime, regime prosecuted the Holocaust across Europe, less well known is the fact that slightly over three quarters of the archive's raw material relates to those classified as DPs, displaced persons by the Allies after the war. My chance encounter with the DP records all those years ago led me to archives that hold information about the DPs across the world, in Paris, Geneva, New York, Berlin, and to the writing of this book. While I was never able to uncover the fate of my grandmother's extended family, I've traced the stories of many others caught up in the maelstrom of survival, displacement, and migration that characterized the DP experience after the war. My book is primarily about the encounters between displaced persons and the refugee and immigration regimes that were created to manage the world's first refugee crisis on European soil in the immediate aftermath of the war. Most of my subjects are actually non-Jewish. The records I've mainly consulted were not applicable to Jewish survivors because by the end of 1945, they were largely exempted from the screening and identification process implemented by the Allies to try and control the millions seeking refuge or trying to get home from Germany, Austria and Italy. By 1946, it had become very clear to the Allies that at least a million or so DPs refused to go back to their country of origin, despite their best attempts to encourage them to do so. These included Soviet citizens who were now hiding in DP camps under new identities as Poles, Ukrainians, or the ever popular Polish Ukrainian label, as well as Jews, Poles, Latvians, Estonians, Lithuanians. At this point, the International Refugee Organization, which took over from the UNRWA, made resettlement rather than repatriation its strategy for dispersing the displaced persons of Europe. My book is about the ways in which the military authorities, the humanitarian workers, the migration officers from resettlement countries and the displaced persons themselves navigated this transition out of Europe to the rest of the world. This transition occurred against the backdrop of the deepening Cold War which soon transformed the legal and political definition of a DP or refugee as we would understand them today, from someone who had suffered under the Nazis to someone who feared future persecution in their country of origin. The first part of this book is about truth-telling in post-war Europe. This was the first time in modern history that um, individuals were required to prove their own or their family's eligibility as displaced persons, uh, for which an elaborate questionnaire and screening process was created. This meant giving an account of their recent pasts to the welfare officers tasked with screening out war criminals, collaborators and ethnic Germans. Telling the personal story of their pasts was a major preoccupation of DPs after the war. Their only ticket out to what many imagined and articulated as a new life in the free world. The concept of truth was vigorously debated by, by DPs and their IRO interviewers. I focus a lot on what telling the truth really meant in the aftermath of the war. Many DPs were remarkably adept at working out what that truth should look like to their benefit. 
And even if they were not, they were able to petition negative decisions multiple times through the IRO Review Board, a remarkable innovation in this period to allow the right of refugees to appeal negative decisions. But the truth was also a malleable concept on the part of the authorities tasked with the problem of assessing the parameters of guilt, perpetration, victimhood, complicity and collaboration. What I found was that these battles over what was true and what was fiction, who was deserving and who was undeserving, were an important part of an evolving dialogue about the recent past. The lines between right and wrong, innocent and guilty, victim and perpetrator were continually being redrawn by decision makers as previously unknown facts emerged and old certainties founded on the rocks of new Cold War realities. For example, by the end, sorry, my dog's just going nuts here. By the end of the 1940s, IRO review officers were instructed by the American leadership of the IRO to grant those who had served in the Galician SS refugee status. These pragmatic shifts revealed another truth that by the end of the 1940s to be seen as communist was far more damaging to one's chances than to be recognised as a Nazi. A new refugee, oh, sorry, given the contrived context of their creation, the records clearly have their limits for what they can tell an historian searching for factual details of wartime experiences. The answers DPs gave to the authorities and the testimonies and petitions they wrote were crafted for a certain purpose and a specific audience. What people wrote is not what necessarily they thought, nor was it necessarily the truth. But what I think we do see is that what made a good or convincing story at the time tells us much about the circulation of ideas about the war, about the Holocaust and about the Jews. For example, this was most explicit in the denunciations that littered the records. Denunciation among fellow DPs became so ubiquitous a practice in the latter period of IRO operations that the IRO, IRO officers dubbed it the DP sickness, even liken, likening it to a physical disease. At a time when apart from the war crimes trials of high profile war criminals, Europe was largely silent on the Holocaust. These denunciations crafted with an eye to the categories that could guarantee a fellow DP's exclusion from the IRO mandate, revealed de details of what, about what people knew and about their knowledge of local perpetrators. A new refugee identity emerged in this period, tied to a vision of the world divided between the old and the new, the free and the unfree. DPs became equally invested in articulating a narrative of persecution that valorised their anti-communist credentials. DPs frequently drew on a language of freedom and justice, helping to mould a contemporary persecution narrative crafted around, around the tropes of national loss, national betrayal, and the right to a democratic future. Indeed, the assertion of a democratic identity became the preeminent marker of legitimacy, quickly surpassing any claim to Nazi persecution. This also indicates how refugees imagined and mythologized the new world of the West, frequently identified as America, in comparison to the old world of Eastern Europe. If anything was absolutely unique about this post-war moment in the history of the refugee, it was that refugee status became intimately associated with the right to mobility. And ironically, given that economic migration was becoming a category of exclusion in international law, the right to a better life. The evolving concept of persecution in international law as a political cat category largely excluded women who were classified as dependents and relegated to the private apolitical sphere. Women who protested the rigidity of this definition were labelled as opportunists or adventurers. The middle section of my book focuses on women, children and the family. While refugee scholars have acknowledged the homogenising impact of international refugee law, 
they have been less aware of the fact that the single category of the political refugee was created with men in mind. DP women and children were only recognised in relation to men. I discuss how definitions of refugee eligibility not only apoliticised women and silenced wives, but excluded gendered experiences of persecution. I also argue that the category of the unaccompanied child was frequently imagined in relation to an abandoning mother and became increasingly weaponised as the Cold War deepened. Eastern European mothers were often regarded with suspicion and disdain by IRO officials who saw better futures for children in the West. The family may have been seen as an important institution for post-war war policy makers who spoke of its rehabilitation as an essential strategy towards achieving the rehabilitation of a civilized Europe. But in reality, families were torn apart by the politics of the Cold War and immigration. The last part of the book examines the policies and practices of migration nations, such as Australia, who took the second largest number of DPs after America. The focus on physical and mental fitness was practiced with particular vigilance by Australian migration officers who cared less about an individual's wartime past than about their suitability to fill, to fill labour shortages and reverse the declining birth rate. As I discuss in this book, this sometimes meant family members, many of them children, were left behind in Europe in order that the rest of the family could leave. The brutal separation of families during the war is much better known. What is less known and which my book makes explicit is that these separations were furthered by the policies and practices of refugee and Western immigration regimes um, after it as well. The exclusion of defective family units, defective in quotation marks, from the possibility of migrating to the new world once again forces us to reevaluate the project of family restoration that stood at the center of Western humanitarian efforts to revive the shattered societies of defeated Europe. Clearly not all families were entitled to the new world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to pass now to Peter, who's going to give his response. Well, first of all, um, thanks to Ruth, uh, not only for that uh, excellent summary of, of, of your book, but, um, you know, it's, this is an opportunity to celebrate the, the publication of what I think is a really first rate monograph um, and also to reflect on its importance. Um, so I wanted to begin by, by saying how much I admire the research that's gone into this book and how beautifully crafted it is. I mean, it's, 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 it's very well written. Um, and if that's not enough, you also include some wonderful photographs. Uh, so anyone who hasn't seen the book, um, I, I recommend it on all those grounds. Um, so I think, let, let's try and think about the significance of what Ruth has done in, in this book. Uh, and I think one of the things one could say is that her book, helps us to understand issues around reconstruction or rebuilding the world after 1945, the Second World War. And in one sense, this is a book about, and I put this in inverted commas, manpower, um, where, where, where are workers uh, to be found? Um, how, how might this manpower be allocated and by whom? And it seems to me that one of the things that Ruth is doing, it's not central to her book, but it contributes to debates around, um, around the whole question of, of labor um, and how these debates were partly about economic issues of, of reconstruction, but also fundamentally political uh, as well. But then I think it's important also to, to understand that what Ruth is fundamentally doing here is giving us a, a contribution to what is now a rapidly expanding field of, of refugee history. Um, and here, I think the originality of what she does is that she enables us to see the, the kind of crystallization of 
what's come to be called the international refugee regime or one of its incarnations after the Second World War. Um, so we end up with a much more finely grained understanding of what that regime was um, and the different actors or elements within it. So this might be the International Refugee Organization and its staff, um, but also um, voluntary aid workers and governments too, of course. But in addition to that, she foregrounds the, the experiences, what she calls the, the multitude of experiences and histories of displaced people themselves. And, and so you get a very compelling sense of, of what refugees' voices are, so to speak. So what we've got, it seems to me, and this is the, the point I wanted to make about the originality, is that it's not just here is the regime, or it's not just here are refugees, it's about the dynamic interaction and the encounters uh, between, between, these, uh, between these groups. And that's, I think, what makes it a landmark study. I mean, there are, uh, as specialists know, um, studies of the International Refugee Organization uh, by political scientist Louise Holborn, which is now what, half a century old. Um, but what Holborn was not interested in or didn't have space to, to talk about in her blockbuster book uh, was precisely how DPs themselves acted and expressed themselves. So the way of approaching this is by looking at the, the material that the International Refugee Organization developed, and particularly through the actions of the so-called eligibility officers. And one, one of her sources, and one of the things she, she traces is the, the eligibility manuals uh, that the IRO compiled, which became, became a kind of dynamic um, <clears throat> reflection on who was to be recognized as a refugee, who might be entitled to resettlement and so on, um, and who was not uh, eligible. And this manual was not a kind of inert Bible, uh, so to speak. It, it, it was dynamic. It was added to constantly as new cases came forward. And that's a really interesting way of thinking about about the refugee history. And this went hand in hand with discussions that took place in memoranda, in a kind of uh, correspondence and so forth, but also uh, in the corridor between IRO officers about who was, who was eligible, um, <clears throat> do we trust this person? Do we believe this person? What about his or her health status, mental uh, and, and physical? So as Ruth was saying a moment ago, She's interested in following the, the tactics that DPs adopted, what they thought would work to convince the officials um, and what didn't work. Um, she has this lovely phrase early on about one official who, who talks about this as a kind of mystery novel, that there's, some, there's something both creative about DPs' constructions of their narrative, but also something that was always kind of left unspoken or might be difficult to, to, to detect, although the IRO officials thought of themselves as a kind of detective uh, agency. So, and one of the other striking things to me was the way in which you have this eligibility apparatus, but then you also have a system of appeal. Um, and this is very um, distinctive, it seems to me, because when the International Refugee Organization becomes a UNHCR, the Office of the United Nations High Commission for Refugees in 1951. The whole process of eligibility determination continues and UNHCR uses the old eligibility manual and only updates it in 1962, so 10 years after it's formed. Um, but um, the um, eligibility manual uh, becomes a kind of cornerstone um, but the appeals process seems to vanish. And that's, I think, is, is something that hasn't really been uh, recognized. It's a very elaborate appeal system in the late 40s until 1951. And then it, it vanishes as if, as Ruth was saying a moment ago, uh, as if 
with the Cold War intensifying, if you're the IRO, you're now turning a blind eye to those people who were earlier on being investigated and scrutinized very closely because of what they might have done as collaborators or worse during the Second World War. And then lastly, the significance of this book, and it should have been obvious to me uh, before I read it, but the material that she works with is, good, is not just about the here and now, about DPs trying to establish their, their eligibility, but about the stories they tell uh, about the Holocaust um, and, and about the Second World War in general. So it's a very rich source base for anyone who's interested, not in DPs or refugee history, but in the history of the Second World War itself. So just a couple of questions I wanted to, to ask uh, Ruth to, to reflect on. The, the, the first is about the source material, the limitations as she uh, un understands it. The difficulty which I've found with the UNHCR material in trying to work out what happened next, you know, what was the fate uh, of, of people who, who exist in the records and, and there are fragments very often, but, but finding out their subsequent trajectory can be very, very frustrating. And that links to questions about you know, silences and gaps. She talks about, about the marginalization of women or their presence as kind of dependents. So I wondered if, if she has anything she wants to, to say about the kind of gaps and the silences in this record. And the other question is a much more personal one. I, having looked at a lot of case files from the 1950s through to the mid 70s, it's you are the researcher, you know, at a distance of, of decades, intruding into the lives, so to speak, of, of people who who figure in the in the written record. And I, I wanted to know what you, what kind of emotional response you have uh, to this material. Did it did it make you cry, as it, as it sometimes does when I read records? Or does it make you jump for joy when you read about DP's kind of inventiveness and creativeness? Or, you know, I mean, it, it could be both, of course, but I'm interested in how you respond emotionally. And then finally, of course, where we are now and, and to what extent you, you think we're inhabiting an entirely different universe um, 70 years uh, on. Or are there fundamental similarities in deciding this, this really wretched question about who is eligible, bearing in mind that eligibility comes from the Latin root for someone who is worthy. So, you know, discussions at this time about who is worthy um, seems to me that discussions that continue to resonate uh, today. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, I'll hand over to Sheila. Thank you. Uh, well, I thought since uh, Peter has so beautifully covered the uh, the perspective of uh, refugee migration history, that I'd take another tack, and I'd look at this as uh, a work of sociocultural history, and think of it in terms of the contribution that it it makes in that field. In other words, to people who are not necessarily primarily concerned with migration, but are interested in how people behave. Uh, for anybody interested in how people operate in particular social and cultural environments, uh, this uh, is a beautiful liminal case, it seems to me. These displaced persons in Europe after the Second World War are outside their familiar environments, although they carry the habits of those environments with them. Uh, they're adapting uh, to a new structural institutional framework. They're learning how to play the system. Uh, and they're forming new temporary communities with the other individuals. In other words, in the camps, the formation of community in the camps, which is terribly hard. It's and, uh, at, and nobody can quite get at it because I think you'd, you'd have to do a, a detailed study of camp publications. And even then you wouldn't. But it truly is interesting to think of the uh, of this process of uprooted people thrown randomly with other uprooted people, forming communities, then leaving, going to some other place, sometimes being totally separated from those people that they bonded with, but sometimes not. 
because we see with the uh, those who came to Australia uh, quite a lot of preservation of, of specifically DP camp community uh, uh, relations. Now, the other thing uh, that makes displaced persons such a great uh, topic for social historians, social cultural historians, is that individually, uh, they are constantly required to tell their stories, to get up and say who they are. Uh, now, in normal life, we, some, we do have to do this, but uh, perhaps not, uh, not so relentlessly as if you're a displaced person. Uh, by focusing on, it, so they're constantly required to tell their stories. Now, true or false, it doesn't matter. Uh, you have to have an autobiographical narrative uh, that suits the circumstances. Now, by focusing on those eligibility appeals to the IRO, uh, Ruth Moore, I think than anyone else in the field, uh, has captured and analyzed that aspect of displacement, uh, the, the, the forcing of the narrative of your life story. Uh, now, I've encountered this in another context, that is revolutions. It's another, or at least this, the, the Bolshevik revolution in the Soviet Union, it's another context in which uh, people are required constantly to say who they are, to identify themselves, to prove, in this case, their eligibility for revolution, but in the case of the DPs, their eligibility for IRO care and protection, and subsequently uh, resettlement. Uh, now, one of the characteristics of self-narratives under stressful circumstances, uh, like displacement, uh, is that they can be challenged. Uh, authorities can challenge them. In other words, you, you put up your story uh, to, uh, 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 before a committee when you're trying to get DP status in the first place, and somebody may knock it down. Somebody may say, you're actually a war criminal, you're actually folks Deutsch, you're not, uh, which means you're not eligible or whatever. But it can also be challenged by fellow, fellow dis, displaced persons. And this is a, a, a wonderful topic that Ruth has, has, has uh, devoted a whole chapter to. That is the topic on denunciation, uh, where uh, you challenge somebody else's autobiographical narrative. You try to discredit their claims to be the person they say they are. Uh, and at the same time, implicitly, you're putting yourself up as the good person, the person who has the right life, uh, whereas this person has the wrong life. Now, there's one of the, those examples that I particularly wanted to, um, uh, 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 to comment on and maybe ask an additional question, but you don't have to answer my questions Ruth, at the end, but uh, I'll just throw it out in case uh, you do. Now, this is a question of mutual denunciation of, uh, of non-Jewish Hungarian DPs, uh, and you mentioned this in your opening, opening uh, speech, about complicity in crimes committed against Jews in Hungary uh, during the war. Now, I find this interesting on, on multiple levels. First of all, uh, uh, it, it seems that Jewish DPs, Hungarian Jewish DPs, didn't often denounce non-Jewish Hungarians on these grounds. And I wondered why. Uh, that, I mean, there is the point, uh, she, uh, Ruth makes the point uh, that the I, may, that maybe it's not worth it because the IRO has no prosecutorial or, or punitive functions, uh, but there are denunciations written, uh, always a minority of denunciations are actually written with what seems in quest of justice, so to speak, out of an instinct, out of a feeling of injustice that something is not known. And of course, there is also the question of the feeling of revenge via reputational damage. I would have expected uh, some Jewish denunciations uh, on these grounds. Uh, but uh, so then to shift to the fact that there you, you have non-Jewish Hungarians denounce, denouncing other, uh, other similar people. Now, this is particularly interesting in the context of uh, a general uh, silence uh, in, uh, in Hungary in particular, uh, or in Eastern Europe, a general silence about this particular kind of wartime crime. And uh, in other words, uh, crimes against the Jews. 
Uh, now, presumably, when in the DP context, uh, these people are accusing their targets of, uh, uh, when they're, they're accusing them of crimes against the Jews, the broader heading is they're accusing them of collaboration and war crimes, I assume. Because collaboration and war crimes, if you are judged to have committed these things, you are not eligible for IRO care or for the care of UNRWA, which uh, preceded it. Uh, uh, so, so then you're thinking, well, why particularly crimes against the Jews rather than, than other uh, crimes committed during the war? Uh, these, is it because they're the, they, surely they're not the only war crimes they can uh, come up with. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, there's a particular oddness uh, in terms of a general convention of silence. Now, and here's my question. If there was in the DP camps a convention of silence, do we know that or not? I don't know it. I, 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 and I'm not sure that I think that one can know it, but one, one cannot exclude that in these particular communities have, has been built up a culture that, that, that is not quite the same, cult. it's not the culture they left, it's not the, it's not the IRO's culture, uh, it's something different. Now, uh, Ruth's book also shows us what a wonderful context displacement provides for memory studies. In addition to looking for a usable past, one good for getting DP status and uh, resettlement rights, people also, also looked for a useful one uh, and they had an eye for what is not useful in their biography. It is not useful for a displaced person to have a husband or wife and children back home. If you have those things, and indeed many of them did, forget it, just forget it, ditch them. Uh, uh, that's the past. That's an almost, uh, that doesn't mean that you ditch the, the ones that survived that, that, that may be found in Europe, but if they're on the other side of, of, of what was becoming to be called the curtain, well, then I think you, uh, you just forget about them. Uh, it is useful on the contrary to have been mistreated Good to have been mistreated by the Nazis, uh, but as time passes and Cold War takes hold, even better to have been mistreated by the communists. Uh, it's uh, conversely, it is not at all useful to have received any privileges or advantages or to have held any office or to have received higher education or to have done anything, <laughs> to have got any benefits uh, in the time that you were living under Nazi occupation or alternatively under uh, Soviet uh, rule. Uh, now, it's also not useful to suffer or to have ever suffered from any illness, physical or, or, or psychiatric. Uh, you want to be totally uh, uh, healthy. Uh, now, one of the things that interests me uh, uh, about the memory aspect is that I think decades down the track, these same DPs now now Australians or Americans or whatever they are, uh, they will often tell their story uh, in terms of some familiar literary templates. Uh, if you come from the Soviet Union, you tell it in terms of Solzhenitsyn's Gulag. Uh, you, you may tell a Holocaust story in terms of Elie Wiesel, uh, etc. Et but at this time, those templates don't exist. <laughs> they haven't been written. Uh, you might say to a point they are being written, they are being created uh, by the DPs. This is part of the creation uh, of those uh, templates. Now, um, quickly on the women, uh, the women who are just dependents, uh, who don't, you know, their status, you don't, you don't judge their status, but that of the male that they're associated with. Yes, absolutely. On the other hand, uh, we know about, their situation because they wrote complaints. They wrote appeals in which they told their story. They told their story as if they were, <laughs> as if they were a man, so to speak. Uh, sometimes they even tell more of their story. Uh, so I agree uh, that they are disempowered, but I feel there's a limit to that. They're, they, one needs to qualify that slightly in that they're not disempowered to the point that they don't think that they can tell their story because they do think they can tell their story. And they hope that their story will be listened. They expect, as a matter of fact, 
that they don't necessarily, I think, expect a favorable outcome, but they do expect that De Bear or whoever it is, is going to read this stuff and they're right to expect that, uh, because he will. So finally, let me just say that this is an extraordinarily moving book, uh, though it's not written as a sort of tearjerker. It's written uh, in, 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 uh, with detachment, but at the same time, uh, well, Peter mentioned the, the, you know, the, the bringing of tears to your eyes in archives. Well, this can also happen when you're reading uh, a, a monograph like this one. Not so often, but it does. Uh, and uh, for me, the, the, the most um, moving was that question of the mothers with the disabled children. Uh, if you had disabled children uh, or a disabled child, uh, the IRO uh, would encourage you to uh, commit that child to an institution, telling you that that was the best for the child. And it was particularly the best for your other children. You owed it to the other children to resettle and, um, and give them the chance for a better life. The IRO people could get quite aggressive even. Uh, 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 with, with mothers who just said what I'm going to say, or in one case, a father. That's, uh, the, I think, it's probably a rare case, but also uh, a moving one. Uh, and the, the saddest of all these stories that I found anyway, uh, it's the ones where the mother initially really resists leaving this child and they wear her down and wear her down, it goes on and on and other people leave and maybe the IRO is going to close down altogether and you'll never be able to get out and it's the last boat. And so they agree. And you can't help thinking, what does that mean for them down the track? You know, what kind of unhappiness did they uh, get uh, left with? And then finally, uh, really finally, um, that um, question, uh, to, which also has uh, a, a fascinating chapter about the DPs who subsequently separated from family members, try to find them. They try to find them by writing to the Red Cross usually and telling the Red Cross to asking them to look for that missing person. Uh, but what Ruth found out uh, and, uh, I, and nobody knew before uh, is that the Red Cross often, when they found the person, if they found the person, if they judged, it was not in the person's interest to be reunited with the person searching, the mother, the former wife or whatever, uh, they didn't, they told the, the petitioner that they couldn't find the person. Now, I think it's always men uh, who are in court, it's not found, but you, uh, 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 you, you can correct me if you've got any women there, but uh, uh, it, it's a very, it was to me a very um, uh, striking thing. Uh, and somehow I put it in that context of lying. You know, DPs tell lies all the time themselves and the authority still lies to them too, a lot. And they know that the authorities tell lies, but one might have thought that they would exempt the Red Cross uh, but it looks, doesn't it, as if this wasn't altogether so, because we do have the odd case uh, in which people uh, people said the Red Cross told me the family was was gone, but you know you can't believe them. Uh, so they didn't. Uh, that suggests, though we don't have enough data on that, it suggests that they didn't trust the Red Cross. They they knew that they might be giving be get, getting the runaround there. So I wonder if you're a DP, if you if you really believe or trust any authority while you're a DP. And then I wonder, and this is a question you could answer if, 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 you, if you feel like it, what that means after you've stopped being a DP, after you've become an assimilated Australian or whatever, uh, what's the question, what's your situation vis-a-vis -vis trust, both trust of the authorities and trust of other people? That's it. Thanks so much, Sheila. And I think a really common thread that is, is coming across in both of these responses is just how incredibly rich this is as, as a piece of history. Um, Ruth, I will just in a second hand over to you for potentially a, a bit of a brief response to those two, because I'd like to keep, to keep some time for audience questions. And as Ruth is responding, if you have a question, please feel free to um, use the raise hand button um, and I'll call on you as soon as Ruth has finished with her response. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you both for that um, really great 
uh, discussion of my work. Um, there's so much there that I could talk about. I'll just very briefly respond. So uh, Peter, you asked me about the limitations, the silences and gaps in these sources. And it is particularly difficult, I think, when you're looking at um, trying to understand the experience of forced migrants, because as soon as you are ejected from a national space, you usually are uh, ejected from, uh, you know, you're, you become, there's a certain silence um, that ensues. Uh, and historians have found actually um, working with the records, trying to humanize the refugee story, particularly difficult. I was very um, in, lucky in my discovery of a discrete body of records held first with the the forms I discussed with the IRO and with the Inter International Tracing Service that gave me names and allowed me then, and I think without names, it actually becomes very difficult to, um, to give a, a sort of history from below about, about these people, but it did allow me to, um, to see this, but I think also you mentioned, well, one of the innovations of, of this moment in time is that refugees are allowed to make constant appeals. And in that constant appeal making, their story, you can map how they are rewriting their narratives and recrafting the story to better suit what they think the authorities want to hear. And this is a novelty in itself, but it also, I think, shows how much um, that period, there was a far more flexibility and openness in dealing with refugee cases, this right of, this right of, of appeal. Um, and also the IRO very much saw its, its work as a collaborative um, project with displaced persons. It makes it explicit in that manual that you discussed. And there's a real, attempt to give people the benefit of the doubt. Even when they come forward and say, oh, look, I lied before, but, but you know, I, 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 actually the truth is this, and this document, yes, it's, it's, it's a forgery, but the reason is this, often could actually um, sway the decision. So that, that's quite interesting. But there are lots of gaps. There are lots of silences. I don't pretend to be able to trace whole lifetimes in this work. I do focus on that those encounters with power that actually allow us to see something of, of what, what DPs were thinking at that time. Um, why, uh, sorry, my emotional response? Well, as Sheila said, perhaps, perhaps both the most emotional um, material for me was the stories of these families with disabled children. Um, it's not just putting them in an institution down the road. It's actually putting them into just institutions and leaving to go to the other side of the world, usually forever. Um, and families who are trying to get um, diagnoses for these children that often only have, might have autism, might have epilepsy, might have a lazy eye. Um, these are all rejected by the migration officers and families are being put into this position of having to make a decision around sacrificing for that child or for the rest of the, the family. And as, as Sheila said, often quite aggressively, um, but there are cases where families resist this too. So there's quite um, interesting cases of resistance and one case in particular where the family um, gives their daughter, their so-called disabled daughter, the healthy daughter's um, identification, identification documents, she goes on ahead to the United States and then they're able to travel and with the healthy daughter just to say she lost her documents. So there's interesting ways in which people try to navigate these, um, these laws. Um, Jewish people are denouncing constantly. Um, I, don't, I don't think that Jewish people don't denounce, but the IRO um, is perhaps not a body that Jewish people think 
to go and denounce too. And often it happens that once a war criminal or a collaborator gets DP status, it's then that they become visible to Jewish people as, um, as someone who's escaped the arm of the law. And what you often see is that in countries where of um, like second or third countries, that is where often the denouncements are happening um, rather than on the ground in Europe. But I, I do think that there's, and, and in fact, I, I talk about a really important case in my book of, of one man that at the Wiesenthal actually is, um, you know, behind a denouncement and he still gets through and he still gets to, and he's, you know, accused of murdering hundreds and he's still able to um, uh, get, eligibility for various reasons at this time that I won't go into now. Um, I should probably I stop there as it's eight minutes to the hour. I could, sorry, I'm sorry, I'll talk more, Sheila, about this uh, at a later time. Um, we have a question from Jerry. Oh, hi there, good evening. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. Well, I haven't yet read Ruth's book, but I have got to get my hands on it. I've heard so much tonight that is so attributable to my primary field of the American Civil War and war between the states. I mean, the topics raised uh, things like uh, the forced relocation of persons with my research into things like the Kentucky Orphan Brigade. After the war, these, this body that had sided with the Confederacy is rejected and not welcomed back into their by their union uh, adhering neighbors in Kentucky, and the forced deportation of the Roswell, Georgia millworker women who were transported by force into the North, and very few of them were ever allowed to return to the uh, to their homes in Georgia, and denunciation. It's just fascinating. I mean, you see this in Black American history after the war when figures such as Frederick Douglass and Martin Delaney, who had been close colleagues before and during the war, now try to denounce each other uh, when Douglass sides with the, with the Republicans and Martin Delaney sides with Wade Hampton, ex-Confederate general in South Carolina. So Ruth, what I'm really interested in, in the historiography, in the sifting of various camps who put critical reflection to this massive swath of evidence. Have you found, as I unfortunately have in my field, is any evidence that would directly contest any of the arguments that are produced by historians? Is any of the, argu any of the evidence deliberately hidden away? It's ignored in plain view. It's basically scream down when it's tried to be addressed and this evidence would force a reevaluation of the critical reflective arguments that are gleaned from it. So have you found anything of that order? And if you haven't, you're very lucky. <laughs> I'm not quite sure I understand the question correctly. Um, what I do know is that this was a, that, you know, the, the IRO screening officers are constantly instructed to be on the lookout for um, people who are not telling the truth. And, tell, and so what I find is that there's this constant debating and fighting over what is, it, what is the truth, what is evidence, um, how do we understand the events of the recent war. And so there's this this actually, this, these encounters, these negotiations, these discussions, these conflicts um, actually lead to change in the way eligibility is assessed by the end of the 1940s. So that manual of eligibility that was mentioned is rewritten four times, you know. So it is, this is a moment in when that history of the war is being, it's very um, contested it's still try, it's still being understood. So it's that immediate moment after the war where the evidence that DPs bring about their local experiences 
um, informs how then um, this manual, so-called manual of eligibility starts to be written. Sure, thank you. Uh, we had Conrad Quit, I think, and then uh, Joy de Moussi. Conrad, sorry, I think you're muted. I have to unmute. Yeah. 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 I want to say something what Peter has raised. Namely, the question, what happened with the DP once they disappeared elsewhere, rebuilding their lives? And there is one monumental archival treasure trove which answers that question. And this treasure trove is even more important in my view than the holdings of Arosen. And these are restitution files from Jews and non-Jews, those who sought compensation from Germany and other countries from the 50s onwards, they lodged application, they told their stories, and these restitution files contain a database for the entire life history from birth till the end. Arelsen is more or less focused on Nazi period and DP. The restitution records yeah, cover the entire lifespan of people. Now there are millions of records housed in the so-called offices for restitution in German states, the Australian ones in Zaboy. They are all under strict lock and key, although I get gradually access to sums because they are very rigid periods of protection imposed. But they are currently digitalized. And I think in five, 10 years time, historians will have access to a treasure trove, which so far has been not accessed. Thanks, Conrad. Joy? Thank you. I'll keep it brief. I've only got two minutes, Ruth. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Ruth. I haven't read the book yet, obviously, but congratulations. Can't wait to read it. It sounds extraordinary. I know it's extraordinary. And lovely to hear from our friends and colleagues, Peter and Sheila, wonderful comments. My question is really a question by an Australian historian, I suppose. And it's really, and you're not going to be able to answer it in two minutes, but I am just wondered, could, how would you characterise the reception of DPs here in Australia that might be distinctive to other parts of the world? And you mentioned that the US, Australia was, you know, only after the US, the, the second biggest reception, you know, um, you know yeah. receiver of uh, DPs. I mean, the assimilation policy was very uh, pronounced here, as obviously, as you know, the way Australia policy was and the whole question of racial anxiety and you know, Indigenous Australia and, and that narrative. I mean, does that give it a different complexion at all about the reception? Um, I mean, I'm not asking you for a comparative history, but is there something distinctive about Australia and its reception of DPs? Um, maybe there's maybe there's nothing, I don't know. But it's oh, just I think, really... Yeah, I mean, I think there is. I think the, the furthering of family separation is, is a really distinctive feature. Mm -hmm not just in, in who we allowed to come here, which often meant leaving people behind, because mm. we preferred young, fit men mm. um, for our labour program, but, it, it, but also once they got here. Mm. So, you know, once people arrived, there was a, a real um, tendency to separate husbands and wives and to continue that story of family separation that's one thing the hostility towards accepting Jew Jewish refugees is another one that I think really um, marks Australia out as quite unique I'm not saying that other countries were really open to having Jewish refugees but we did practice a really restrictive uh, immigration policy towards Jewish refugees which meant they weren't welcome on the DP scheme they had to pay their own way they had to get sponsored um, and I think that's another distinguishing factor um, but yeah and also because Australia is far away it's I think it, geographically it's important to consider that, um, you know, the distance made it hard 
to um, trace family, to be reunited with family. And, um, and that, that's also, I think, a distinguishing factor. Mm. Just the fact of geography is, mm. is important too. Thanks, Rose. Looking forward to the book. Thanks, Joy. <laughs> Um, thank you, everybody. We might uh, come to a close there um, as we've just gone over time. Um, so we'll be starting up the history books uh, series again next year. The first session will be with Mina Rosses uh, on the Filipino migration experience, global agents of change. And she'll be in conversation with Professor Rick Bonas, who's a professor of history at the University of Washington in Seattle. And that will be happening uh, Friday, February 25th at 10 a.m. Um, and so I can send, I'll send out links to everybody. So once the registration is open for that. Um, but before we close, I would like to give another congratulations to Ruth for such a fantastic um, book, which, you know, I mean, everything that's been said today has already, I, th I think, sold it quite well. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's a masterful piece of writing. Um, and so well done. And thank you, everybody, to co for coming today and for joining our series this year. Well done, Ruth. Special applause. Thank <laughs> Thanks, you, everyone. <laughs> yeah.